As we face this week's heat wave, although it doesn't feel so bad in here, as we face this week's heat wave, I'm going to hazard a guess that many of us found ourselves complaining a little more than usual. Today, specifically, possibly over the past few hours, maybe as you walked here to shul, you found yourself complaining. Oppressive heat is enough to make anyone ornery. But among Jews, <laughs> I don't even need to finish the sentence. You know the story, a waiter walks up to a group of Jews in the restaurant and says, just want to check, is anything OK? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're going to be here all night, pretty much. <laughs> I will, and I, it's already 2 AM in my head. It's an oldie, but it slaps. <laughs> and it's appropriate to begin a drash that way, since this week we read in Parshat Bahalotcha, one of the more famous examples of the Israelites complaining in the desert, which feels really special, as appropriate for this Shabbat. As the Israelites continue wandering, the Parsha explains, Vayhi ha'am kemitonanim, the people were looking to complain. The verse doesn't immediately say what they were complaining about. So Rashi picks up on this and points out that this particular word for complaining, mitonanim, implies that the people were looking for a pretext to complain. Rashi suggests that they didn't actually have any material reason to complain at all, since God was protecting them. But something internal was going on with them, and they had an urge to gripe nonetheless. This explains the prefix chaf in the Hebrew, or kaf kamitonanim, because it was as if they were complaining, which some medieval commentators suggest might mean that the Israelites were not yet ready to verbalize their frustration to Moses outright, because they hadn't come up with a good enough reason to do so. But soon enough, they land on one. A hunger comes over the people. Classic. And this. <laughs> I told you, things are going to get weird. It's the jet lag. Do with it what you will. And this ultimately serves as the pretext they were looking for. They want to eat meat, but all they have is mana. Now, I've mentioned before at services, and those of you who are regulars have heard different versions of this, but occasionally when you read the text of the Torah itself, just the literal translation, it feels like shtick. And because I can't help myself, I want to return to that shtick. And so I read now the direct translation of Numbers 11. Would that we were given meat to eat. <laughs> we remember such fish that we ate in Egypt free of charge. <laughs> the cucumbers, the watermelons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our insides are shriveled. We've got nothing. We have nothing except for this mana to look at. You can almost hear them shrine gavalt. <laughs> but this is the plain text of Numbers 11, folks. Now, we know that this is not the first of the Israelites' complaints in the wilderness. It is, however, the first of many complaints in rapid succession in the book of Numbers. The Israelites will soon freak out over the existence of giants in the land of Canaan, and shortly thereafter, they will lament a lack of water in the desert. Here, they focus on wanting meat. But it's not really about the meat. So what's actually going on here? Nachmanides suggests that the people are tired of using their imaginations every time they eat manna. The manna was supposed to taste like whatever they desired, but they knew it wasn't. They were tired of waiting for the real deal, and maybe tired of waiting for the promised land, too. But Rashi chimes in with a deeper rationale. They're complaining because they're trying to distance themselves from God, he teaches. We can imagine the Israelites in this moment skeptical about this invisible God who is supposed to love them, scared about the future. They're like a hesitant lover almost, uncertain about the love of their partner and maybe even uncertain about whether or not they deserve to be loved. So they try to push God away in any way they can. They complain about wanting meat, but really, maybe they just wanted distance. 
As modern readers, we can maybe relate to this, making up one issue to cover up for a bigger one. It's a deeply human and universal sort of experience. Many of us convince ourselves of one problem to mask a bigger problem that we don't want to deal with in our relationships with our friends, our work environments, or our partners. And it's understandable that the Israelites would be nervous and skeptical about their relationship to, to a God who is unlike anything they could have ever known in Egypt or anything they could have known in slavery. Maybe it is merely their slave mentality or their fear of the future. But in any case, they're frightened of this kind of intimacy with God. They feel unworthy, perhaps. And though they focus on having empty stomachs, maybe they're dealing with a different kind of emptiness, a psychological or a spiritual one. And so they lash out in an expression of self-destruction. The Hasidic commentator known as the Ma'or Vashemesh picks up on this in his commentary on this week's Parsha. He too comments on the fact that the Torah is vague about what's going on in the emotional lives of the Israelites. But he understands that the people's complaint is masking something else. And because they don't work through their issues, they fail to really have a relationship with God. To really serve God, he explains, you have to allow yourself to be happy and to be held even when it feels like you are lacking something. Each of us has within us some kind of uncertainty and some kind of sadness, he teaches. And sometimes we can be overwhelmed by this feeling. He writes, this sadness at first manifests inside us as a desire to eat. Then from the desire to eat comes other desires, like sex. And soon one can no longer overcome these lusts and break one's desires. Writing over 200 years ago, the Ma'or of Shemesh is describing something that is timeless. The experience of letting your emotions run amok, throwing your life out of control. By not dealing with a feeling head on, we might become overly reliant on easy explanations and quick fixes that ultimately lead us to deeper pain. But there must be a way for us to move in a more positive direction toward God and toward ourselves. His prescription for us is not to withhold from eating and drinking and engaging in physical pleasures when we feel we want those things. Rather, he explains, our task is to bring things that give us physical joy into the experience of the holy. He writes, the righteous person eats good food and drinks wine. He wears fine clothes and lives in a nice house. But as he does these things, he performs a divine service elevating holy sparks and bringing everything into holiness. In other words, these physical things are good things as symbols of God's abundance in this world, and they should not be avoided unnecessarily. As Rabbi David Kasher points out, the problem with our lust is not the physical pleasure itself. It is the attempt to use physical medicine to cure a spiritual malady. Instead of curing our spiritual needs with physical pleasures, we should bring our spirituality into our physical lives. Our enjoyment of life is enhanced by the quality of our consciousness. Though the Israelites complained about manna, they were sustained by it. It was a symbol of God's love for them, but they couldn't see it. They had emotional blocks that got in the way of their relationship with God, and they made up excuses for their discontentment. They looked outward for a struggle that was inside of them. Soon in the Torah, we'll read that this same impulse is what prevented them from entering the promised land. When we think of our own lives, inevitably there are things that are preventing us too from entering our various promised lands. We might think we know what they are and we might lament them, but maybe the things we complain about aren't the real barriers to getting to where we need to go. This reading of the Parsha suggests that if we ourselves are to arrive at a place of abundance, safety, and health, it's worth asking, what are we complaining about right now? What do we say is the issue, and what else might be going on here? Complaining might feel good. Externalizing our frustrations might relieve us or let off some steam. But in order to get to where we need to be, we need to know the core of our feelings, because only through approaching real emotion, working through the real frustrations of life and love, can we find the nourishment that we need. 
Shabbat Shalom.